I'm Lewis McKenzie. I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a postdoc at the University of Leeds, and I'm a keen science communicator. I try to get involved in science communication whenever and wherever possible. However, it's not always easy for early career researchers to get involved in science communication. And so what I want to talk about today is what helps and what hinders science communication by early career researchers. And I think actually this would have made a really good unconference session. So instead, it's going to be a sort of lightning quick whirlwind 15 minute talk through basically a brainstorming session that I've been doing for the past few months in my head. I would very much like to get ideas and opinions from the audience because there's a lot more of you than me and you've got a lot more diverse experiences than I do. Uh, but let's just uh, start by thinking who are early career researchers? I think of undergraduates or a huge group of early career uh, science communicators that are largely untapped. Uh, we've got PhD students as well, obviously a lot of PhD students in the room today. And we've got postdocs, relatively smaller amount due to um, the shaky career path that we have to go down. Um, but what I want to think about today is what do universities and other organisations do well to help uh, early career researchers perform science communication and what could be done better? Okay, so, but before I start, I want to say there are some shared barriers to science communication. Uh, things like travel cost and time. Uh, if you're trying to uh, do science communication in some remote part of Scotland, or if, frankly there's a lot of parts of Scotland that are actually uh, not uh, remote in terms of the distance from a city, but they're just hard to get to by public transport, for example. Uh, also, I think there's a big issue with recognition that science communication is work, but a, job, a lot of jobs don't recognise the time that you put in a science communication as part of either official work <laughs> or as training hours, for example. And also, uh, people can have uh, supervisors that don't have a very helpful attitude towards science communication. Uh, you've maybe heard some horror stories. Uh, helpful supervisors for early career researchers are a huge boost to science communication. And of course, we have all the other barriers uh, that are involved with career in science. I won't talk about them today, uh, but we know that there are many. And what I want to talk about are these six topics. Uh, the training early career researchers get, uh, doing science communication skills, uh, the science communication competitions that are quite prevalent in PhDs, uh, research conferences, grant impact plans, and uh, I'll finish up with science communication fellowships. Uh, so these are just topics that I thought I had some good thoughts about. Uh, hopefully you could get your thoughts about them too. So let, let's think about science communication training. Um, uh, I've been through the system as an undergrad, PhD, postdoc, and I think uh, science communication training is primarily aimed at PhD students. And it's primarily aimed at the research skills that the PhD students need, and rightly so. So things like scientific writing, uh, presenting at conferences, uh, doing an elevator pitch for your research, 30 seconds. I mean, it's very important to do, and I think universities are doing a really good job delivering those skills, and it's improving all the time. I think there are still some issues with uh, this training that I think could be done better, and it's not to say that it's being done better, I just think that we might be able to do it better in future. So things like, uh, as I said, if someone's proactive with science communication, if, uh, for example, you're like uh, Becky and going out into the community and doing lots of events, doing time at the weekend, that isn't recognised as part of your formal working hours. Uh, so, for example, if you're doing science communication in the evening and you end up staying out late, you're still expected in the office at 9am the next day, for example. Um, and I think science communication really needs to be recognised as part of a, a workload or as a continued professional development or as training. Um, I also think that undergraduates are a huge untapped uh, group uh, of science, potential science communicators. And of course, more undergraduate courses are incorporating communications modules, but not necessarily in-depth science communication modules. And you're getting entire science communication master's degrees now. There's a lot of stuff and a lot of topics to investigate there. Uh, and I think uh, undergraduates are a bit shortchanged by the, the training and resources that they get access to. I also think postdocs, if you've missed out in the science communication boat as a PhD student, if you're a postdoc, it's, uh, there's relatively few uh, formal training opportunities, at least at the institutions I've been at as a postdoc, which is only one. So <laughs> take that as a pinch of salt. Um, but I think a big one, media skills training. All, all the science communication training I see is uh, about going, standing in front of an audience and talking to people face to face or doing a presentation. Uh, the media skills, uh, for example, uh, if you want to make a YouTube video, 
how many training opportunities are there for getting hands-on experience from making YouTube videos or podcasts or web comics or illustrations uh, or even uh, writing in a magazine? There's very few training opportunities for that. And I think uh, most science communication is actually consumed through some form of media, not face-to-face -face science communication. So I think there's really something that we could do there to help the training in that regards. And uh, moving on, so Becky talked about science communication in schools. Now, uh, STEMnet is a superb organisation which uh, allows volunteers uh, to link up with schools and STEMnet provides uh, basic training about working in schools, what you can expect, like uh, Becky touched upon, uh, if kids are misbehaving, they'll tell you that the, the teacher will, will deal with that rather than you as some random scientist coming into the school. They also do background checks on people. I really like STEMnet, it's great. I think uh, people maybe face some barriers when it comes to science communication in schools in terms of, first of all, the school curriculum. It's not too bad in Scotland. We've had the curriculum for excellence shake things up. But it's rather confusing in England where you have comprehensive schools, grammar schools, uh, academies, base schools, free schools. The, the last three are probably all the same thing, but <laughs> it is kind of confusing. Uh, I think the big one is age-appropriate communication. How do you talk to a five-year-old compared to a 10-year-old compared to a 15-year-old and a 20-year-old, so on? Um, I think we could uh, use a bit more of that when it comes to science communication training. And quite frankly, as I said earlier in Scotland, just getting to the skills can be tricky. Uh, most PhD students uh, in early career researchers won't have a car, so it involves potentially having to dedicate resources to hiring a car, for example. And then you've got all the baggage of having to have someone who can actually drive and all those sort of things. It's a basic thing, but it is a barrier to science communication in schools. Um, now, a little thing to touch upon, uh, science communication competitions. I, I, I've done these three science communication competitions, three minute thesis, fame lab, science slams. They're mainly aimed at PhD students and they've got incentives if, in terms of you get some experience communicating your research, you get some training, and you can potentially get prizes, which is nice. Um, I noticed there's some gaps in the way that science communication competitions that are done. And I think most science communication competitions are this sort of conventional stand and talk format with people. Um, but again, why not engage with some other medias? Why are there not more uh, science communication video formats or radio interviews or science communication webcomic competitions? I think there's some options there. And I also think in terms of collaboration with other people, um, Science communication is often considered a solo thing, but really the best science communication happens uh, if you're part of a team, I think. Um, and the world famous science communicators, they have a team of people behind them helping uh, with their shows and their documentaries and everything. And I think a collaborative uh, competition could be really nice uh, and it would take the pressure off a bit. Uh, a lot of science communication competitions generate sort of intense pressure for the people competing in them. And I think that can be a little bit negative or discourage participation. I think maybe, yeah, some collaboration, some alternative media could really benefit that. Okay, now, talking about conferences, we're at a conference all about communication. This came up in Twitter earlier this week, uh, where someone suggested that every conference could include some public engagement or outreach factor. And if you think about it, imagine there's a conference in Edinburgh today, and the conference is about, uh, something like tropical medicine, so you've got talks or experts talking about Zika virus or Ebola. Now if you had an after hours talk uh, about the Ebola virus and the spread of virus in public health, you'd get a huge crowd coming to that. So if you've got experts coming from all over the world flying into a city, uh, maybe conference organisers could uh, maybe organise some uh, public sessions as well. I think that could be hugely beneficial. Um, and after all, you're catching researchers when they're already in the communication mindset. Um, last two things, research grant impact plans. Now, I know we've got a lot of PhD students and ECRs in today. I only came across grant impact plans very recently when I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship. Basically, the UK research councils are asking that people, uh, when they submit a research grant, as well as their big plan for all the research, you know, month by month, uh, they also want a plan that involves science communication. It's generally written by a bunch of professors several years in advance. And it's, I really like it in the way that it dedicates time and money for science communication. 
those vital resources. So it allows researchers to take time out of their research schedule to do science communication. I think that's very good, and it gives them the money to do so. But we do have some issues in that, as I said, it's, uh, they tend to be written by a bunch of professors before they even recruit the person who's probably going to be doing the science communication. So they don't know who's going to be doing the science communication. So they do a bunch of, they might plan a bunch of arbitrary events that aren't very inspiring for that early career researcher or don't suit the skill set of that researcher. And uh, I've also seen, for example, suggestions that you could spend several thousand pounds of grant money on professional website design. Uh, well, quite frankly, you can build yourself a website way cheaper than that uh, using website platforms and you could use the rest of that several thousand pounds to engage people in science communication events. Um, I mean, think, think of the road tour that you could fund with the science show with several thousand pounds. You could probably go around most of Scotland and <laughs> do a quick tour. Um, so I would suggest with these uh, research grant impact plans, we need a slightly more agile approach, which involves uh, the researchers that they recruit uh, to play to the researcher's strengths and not to make it a stagnant box ticking exercise, which it's in danger of being uh, if the PIs, the principal investigators, aren't really on the ball. And the last thing I want to finish up with is uh, science communication fellowships. You might have heard of these fellowships uh, run by, for example, Wellcome Trust and the STFC. These are basically fellowships for what I can only describe as the Olympic gold medalists of science communication, the real elite science communicators out there. And I think they are a great thing in terms of they give people the time and the money and the support to do outstanding and dedicated and time intensive science communication initiatives. I think they're excellent, but they're not particularly great for early career researchers because if you think, for example, about the dates and the time required to apply for one of these. So I, I screen grabbed this from the Wellcome Trust website. Uh, the February 2017 round of these uh, fellowships, uh, the preliminary application goes in February. So you put in a starter application in February, then your full big, big application goes in in June. And then you're shortlisted for interviews sometime in July. And then I assume that, uh, yeah, so the interviews in July, you probably hear back in August. So you're talking six months uh, for this whole application process. Now, considering most postdocs, for example, are on really short-term contracts, three months, six months, one year, they're quite likely to be unemployed by the time this thing comes through. Um, and it might be okay for people with uh, permanent jobs that they could uh, uh, that, that have security, but I think for early career researchers who are a huge source of science communicators, maybe there should be some other similar sort of schemes, but more suitable for early career researchers, such as uh, 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 fellowships funded by other funding agencies, uh, maybe with a continuous application process for shorter chunks of time, three months at a time perhaps, with, where there's less money in the line, so uh, the funding bodies can be a little bit not casual, casual is not the right word, but just less super formal than this. Um, and with that, I just want to wrap up a few take home thoughts. So, obviously, early career researchers, undergraduates, PhDs, postdocs, they all have different needs for training at different points in their career, and everyone's individual with different skill sets and different ambitions. I, I think, really, science communication needs to be recognized as a formal part of someone's working hours, its training or education. The fact that uh, if you go out and do a science communication event, you know, people understand if you come into the office a little bit later the next morning. That would be great. It, science communication shouldn't just be an out of hours hobby, really. That's, that's one thing I want to get across. And I think there's brilliant initiatives out there already, but I think there's already a lot more that we can do. And I would love to get the audience's suggestions in this because you guys have a lot more experiences than I do. Uh, <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for listening and I look Woo! forward to getting your suggestions.